According to a new poll, the majority of Americans now oppose Israel's military action in Gaza. On Tuesday, President Biden acknowledged pro-Palestinian protesters who interrupted his speech in North Carolina. Let's listen. They have a point. We need to get a lot more care into Gaza. I want to bring in our political panel now. Shelby Talcott and Hannah Knowles join me now at the table. Shelby is a politics reporter for Semaphore, and Hannah is a national political reporter for The Washington Post. Shelby, I want to start with you. Is what's happening in Gaza a foreign policy political fault line for this White House? And if so, how potentially damaged? Yeah, I think absolutely. And if you talk to Biden campaign officials, they will acknowledge that this is something that, A, they're taking seriously and keeping an eye on, and B, they're recognizing that it is impacting the president's support. Um, there's a growing number of past Joe Biden supporters who are growing increasingly frustrated with him over his Israel policy. And so we've seen, as in that clip, he's starting to sort of try to do some outreach um, but as of now, it's not necessarily enough. So the question is, how far is the president comfortable going on this topic? And is it going to be enough for those voters or do they end up staying home in the 2024 election? And Hannah, this is a difficult situation for the president. He has a long, a decades long relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister. But the Israeli prime minister has a coalition government made up of hardliners who want him to be even more aggressive than he currently is. And the president can only weigh in so much and sway so much of Netanyahu's agenda. Yeah, no, it's it's a really, really tough issue for Biden. And I think they're just their hands are sort of like there's no way that they can um, appease a lot of these protesters and, and members of their coalition. I mean, I, I just can't see Biden taking an action that would make um, a lot of these people happy. Um, it's a tough situation. This is Holy Week in America worldwide. And President Trump, former President Trump, has sort of stepped into this terrain in a kind of, even by Trumpian standards, highly unusual marketing way. Hannah, talk about the former president and his now peddling of Bibles. Yes, yeah, so this is just the latest. Um, we've had uh, NFTs, he's done sneakers, and now he's doing Bibles. Water, steaks, all sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, he is not directly selling the Bibles, but um, he does, he owns a company that has licensed his image um, for the Bible, so he is earning money off of them. And he is endorsing it, I believe. Uh, control room, we have a sound bite to that effect, do we not? Can we roll that? All Americans need a Bible in their home, and I have many. It's my favorite book. It's a lot of people's favorite book. This Bible is a reminder that the biggest thing we have to bring back America and to make America great again is our religion. Religion is so important, it's so missing, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back strong, just like our country is going to come back strong. Shelby, there'll be plenty in the audience who might remember the former president's reference to two Corinthians. I don't know if that falls squarely in my favorite book category or not, but your thoughts. Yeah, I think this is, um, A, it sort of lines up with how Donald Trump has built himself. He's really built himself as sort of this defender of Christian values against you know, the hard left. Um, and it's something that voters historically have bought into, as we've seen. I also think it's notable, you know, he is facing a lot of financial trouble. In the grand scheme of things, based on the financial troubles, this is whatever he gets from this will just be a drop in the bucket. But it's money coming in, and it's money coming in during a time when he's running a presidential campaign and Joe Biden is far ahead in terms of how much money they're working with. And he's you know, he owes millions and millions of dollars in these legal cases. I want to ask both of you, starting with you, Hannah, about this Alabama special election that just was concluded. What should we be reading into it and what should we cautiously not be reading into it possibly? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's another indicator that abortion really does um, matter to voters. It's still potent um, and that the IVF issue, there's good reason to think that that has, has reignited it. And, you know, this was in Alabama, the state where that is maybe most potent. Um, but I think Democrats are really optimistic that this continues to translate in every race they run. Shelby, the last time there was a vote in this district, it went one way and it flipped over. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, if you if you talk to Marilyn Lands, who who you know, won this special election. You know, my colleague talked to her earlier today, and she highlighted how a few years ago, pre-Dobbs, 
she really focused um, her pitch on health care, but it didn't really include abortion. And so this time around, I think it just shows that there's a shifting landscape when it comes to what voters are concerned about. And certainly when you talk to the Biden campaign, they recognize that. They have seen consistently that the topic of abortion has been a political win for them. And if you talk to Republicans, too, they recognize that they're failing on this issue and they need to figure out a way to have an effective message. And it's become increasingly more difficult in a post-Dobbs uh, decision orbit. And when the political landscape includes shifting special election outcomes, even in a place like Alabama, everyone needs to pay attention. Shelby Talcott and Hannah Knowles, thank you so very much.